Hi. Yeah, I don't know about the batting order here. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, anybody hear me? It work? Um, boy, has um, poetry at Tech come a long way. And um, it was really, Tom, I, I forget, we were having a conversation, I think, at Sarah Lawrence sometime, and it was really Tom's idea that came up with the idea of a revolving chair here. And um, I think that was the conceptual stage, and it took a number of years. And uh, I think, um, I don't know that Tom really did it. Did he realized I think it was going to change his life, and we didn't realize Tom was going to do this. And I think it's Tom that's really changed the campus and brought Poetry at Tech here and to its full life. And I think even now we're talking about taking Poetry at Tech on the road. So we've come a, it's come a long, long way. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm, I don't know. You guys are great. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to follow this act, but anyway, I'm going to try. Um, I'm going to read from, uh, I have a chat book and a book, and then I've got some new poems that I've been working on for another book. And uh, so I thought I'd start with uh, some poems out of the first um, book that I did called A Place by Water. This was a memorial to my wife who passed away and my mom who's here tonight took me to Hawaii to sort of get my mind off of it. So I'm going to read a couple of poems from that. This is called, uh, let's see if I can get this, Refuge. Now you need to know for this poem that um, it's amazing the Polynesians, uh, what they did to get to Hawaii, and it really was sort of an act of refuge because they were escaping from something. And in the ancient Hawaiian um, villages, there was always a place of refuge where you could hide, where you could be forgiven if you got there. Um, and particularly if you stepped on the king's shadow, which was meant uh, instant death, unless you could get to the refuge. Okay, this is called refuge. The ancient Hawaiians revered places of refuge, like this black lava flat by an old royal compound in Hanoia Bay. It's staked with some straggly palms and crossed by a pumice block wall divvying the refuge from the thatched roofed royal reserve and the temples by the king's landing lagoon now occasioned by sea turtles. A park ranger in a breech cloth coolly weaves a mat of pond leaves telling the story of his ancestors, Polynesian Vikings who followed a great shark in the luminous constellations of these latitudes. They crossed hundreds of ocean miles in hand-hewn outrigger canoes full of breadfruit, pigs, dogs, searching for new islands and a place of refuge. Here the condemned are those who had stepped on the king's shadow, meaning instant death, could be saved and granted absolution if they could make it to this place. Two. On the road back to Kona, I visited the old painted church, guarded by a friendly dog, the white wooden lattice chapel and its necropolis dug from rust red volcanic slope overlooking the Azure Bay. The interior is a shoebox Sistine, giving the illusion of St. Peter's with columns of palm trees. Through this sacred space, whispering tourist wonder snapping cam cameras. I pick a pew next to the mural of St. Francis Epiphany. I, after a day of dragging my grief around, I prostrate myself, sobbing overtakes me, it happened so suddenly. Did I step on God's shadow? I imagine Jesus coming down from his cross and he offers me an orchid lay. There's breathing next to me, a cold nose on my thigh, and then a paw on my knee, and the mutt gives me the absolution lick. <clears throat> it's called In 
hat, step, clap, turn, and sway. Center stage, their leader croons to the twangy tunes in turquoise tassels. Held Wednesdays at seven, this is a widow's stomp. A single male is a Hawaiian under a Stetson attending to his lover drooling in a wheelchair near the DJ. Rejoining the ladies' lines, he causes a twitter, a bodhisattva in a blue bandana. Clomp, turn, step, clap, kick, and turn with your departed beloved. Their urns of ashes under black marble markers on the volcano slope or my shelf back home. Forget your loneliness. Remember the scroll of surf, the warm, warm sand sifting through your toes, smooching, yeah, and the palm framed sunset on Waikiki just down the street. Nice postcard, cowgirls. I can join your club. Get in line and face the music. Okay. Um, as you know, I spend a lot of time on the road. And I think those of you that have heard these readings have heard this one before. Called On the Road. I love early mornings in a new hotel, traveling west and up east on East Coast time before room service starts delivery, searching the lobby, even down in the kitchen for coffee, to greet the dawn with the night clerk, starting his wake-up calls. I find a paper from a bundle by the revolving door and a town map from the tourist rack, discovering where I am and what's happening. Having missed the previous day, sequester sequestered with clients in a windowless conference room. <clears throat> I hardly notice a busboy picking up last night's glasses and emptying ashtrays to start the lobby over with a worn smile by seven. I begin to feel oddly comfortable before the stir of day, unhurried and almost at home in the contrived elegance of overstuffed couches, old marble and mirrors. I wonder how much of my life has been spent, just like my father's, in rented rooms and strange beds, with our precious time, neatly folded and packed into suitcases and carried between the unforgiving schedule of people and planes. This is from one of my, some of my trips. This is in Germany. Called a little liaison. A falling moon rises between the twin spires of a ghostly Cologne cathedral that looms over the old Roman city on the Rhine. Spires like great spaceships that never got home. I meet the wife of an old friend at a nearby cafe. She's with a date who brought her flowers and an obsequious grin. She tells me her husband's enterprise struggles in the east. He spends too much time there. She tennises at 10. There's a new apartment in Nice, a new Mercedes, and yeah, her new friend. I remember their wedding day in Paris, the incredibly handsome pair. I remember, too, their first child pinned in a blue blanket to contain him while Daddy ran a smelter in Tennessee. I excuse myself early and walk a damp street, stone inlaid street of antique dealers who sell, without sin, the freshly unearthed shards of their Roman past. Little European affairs in those twin Gothic spires. It took 600 years to build. We blacken with our burning of coal. Comment on the energy policy, maybe. Um, I think we've all had <clears throat> epiphanal experiences, and they're sometimes undescribable. So words can't really say some things. This is called Manhattan Morning. It is in the early hour as first light pinks the apartment canyons 
when Gotham stirs and stretches. Then confusion's messenger is easily dispatched. My thoughts let go of the traffic din and all fades to background. Sadness passes and I come close to something huge and still like this city after a heavy snow, silent yet alive. And um, I want to read one from the country where I live, out in the country, in Salisbury. I live on a road with some great farmers. And you need to know for this one that um, you need to know a little bit about Egyptian history. I was doing some, I was going on a trip to Egypt, my wife and I, and so I was doing some due diligence in the Metropolitan Museum, and I came upon this exhibit that they dug up of one of a noble who um, in the Egyptian tombs they keep little boxes of pictures of the farm and the brewery and the dairy and the uh, the wheat floor and whatever so that when he comes back to life or returns he'll have that with him to be able to take with him and enjoy that and you also need to know that Ka is the part of the soul there's there's a concept called Ba which is the, our concept of soul that goes to eternity, and then there's ka that comes back and forth between the land of the living and the land of the dead. It's interesting. How things never change. In a hieroglyphed wooden box, stiff miniature men wearing white kilts and sandals sit tending tiny, exquisitely carved black and white cows just like the Holsteins along the Housatonic at the Shady Maple Farm, manned by my mustached neighbor John and his suspended crew who know all about cows and slog galosh through mud and manure spreading its abundance on their fields. They work on unending chores for their cows, somehow making ends meet until the day they drop. Like their ancient brothers, who tended Metotep's herds by the Nile 4,000 years ago. They travel together, an eternal memory, Ka, from the Middle Kingdom. Um, this is a new poem. This comes from, we go down every Christmas to uh, Florida. To Delray Beach, and this is one I wrote down there actually a couple years ago, but I revised it this last year. <clears throat> Delray Beach. Pelicans control the space over sand and sea. They glide in prehistoric formation like old PBYs my uncle flew in World War II. Sharp-eyed, they peel off and plunge into the waves, re-emerging with squiggly silver meals. I bike along the intercoastal waterway where yachts at anchor seem posed for mutual fund ads. Both sides of the road are chock-a-block with condos, leaving little of the native mango hammock between this path and the waterway, save some landscaped sea grapes and gumbo limbos. High rises top the dune lines down the coast like Manhattan moves south. And above the block-like towers, an overpopulation of buzzards feather afternoon thermals, unemployed and patient for roadkill. Snowbirds, and snowbirds are those that, people that retire and go down to Florida. I'm sorry, I need to explain that. Snowbirds, up from their naps, walk the afternoon beach. Their, watch walk the beach afternoons. Their tracks soon scrolled smooth by the surf. Retired from work in winters, their times now suspended, slowed like the traffic waiting for those yachts to parade under the yawning drawbridges over the intercoastal. Along this path, 
Trees are dedicated to the departed, their names and dates honored on black plastic plaques. I want to know their whole history. That third date when they gave up the hassle and came down to walk by the sea. Um, this last one's a quartet that I wrote for a young man who was my neighbor who passed away. And um, I'm going to read the beginning, the first and the last poem in this. And there's also a reconciliation, but I'm not going to read that. Uh, this is called the first, the, the whole thing's a quartet for Daniel. First part's called A Miracle at the Canaan BFW. The white battle star on the turret of the Sherman tank parked outside the VFW is a beacon through this sleety evening for the citizens of Canaan lining up for a $5 a plate spaghetti dinner. The marquee on the town cinema heralded this dinner from 4 to 8, but the ICQs ebbed about 10. The whole township turned out after work from factories, farms, and shops, and overall flannel shirts and calico flocks, so my farmer neighbor's boy, Daniel, 13, might survive the cancer his surgeons couldn't cut all out. The spit-polished marine auxiliary regulate seating and raffle chances on donations from maple syrup to lawn services, all tracked on a board like a stock exchange. The Church Upkeep Society sells home-baked cookies and cakes. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts serve steaming plates of noodles clobbed with sweet plum tomato sauce. While his separated parents fight over custody, the townspeople adopt the boy ready to fight his battle called rhabdomyosarcoma. It mainly attacks children. Like the defenders of Thermopylae or the Alamo, for them, there's no thought of surrender. Now, the two other quartet maybe just help with the story. Um, the, other, the, the second one's called the christening. It's the christening at Daniel's. I get to know this boy much better as it goes on. And um, it's the christening of his little sister, which is really sort of the hope for the family. And at this, this boy is in remission. And so I'm taking him to a reception, and I ask him what he wants to do. You know, what are you going to do when you grow up? And the little boy looks at me and says, I want to be a senator. And in the third one, um, I don't know how many of you have read Socrates, but the Phaedo is the conversation between Socrates and his students, the last conversation where he explains how the soul goes on and separates and what happens you know, what he thinks about death. And um, I had a very similar conversation with this young man. I was amazed. He, the cancer came back. He decided not to take chemotherapy. And um, it was hopeless. And uh, at the end, he told me that he thought he was going to come back and protect the farmers and their crops. That was his purpose in life. And this is the last one. It's called Preparing for the Next Life. Irritated at staying home for a computer installation, I am surprised when Daniel's mother calls, eager to take me up on my offer to visit the tractor store. His tumor has grown. He can't eat or talk easily, so he has to write everything down. When I get to the cabin, Daniel greets me with his jacket on, slurring, there's not much time. He wants to be sure everything's in stock for his spring landscaping business. I alert the store manager. When we arrive, Daniel surveys the display lot and climbs on one of 50 tractors. The manager says, he's on the exact one I would recommend for this job, and extols its virtues as Daniel motions for paper to list the accessories he'll need. I manage. Uh, we ask the manager to price this up. Inside, Daniel's on a mission, pulling equipment off display racks, stacking a chainsaw, weed whacker, gas can, and leaf blower outside the manager's office. He knows exactly what he needs. We sit in front of the manager's desk 
me not quite sure why I'm there. And Daniel, with his contorted face, looking like elephant man, calm and businesslike, reviews the tally in his blue plaid hunter's cap, his blue plaid hunter's cap askew. Being November, we take the leaf blower, but Daniel's too weak to even give it a trial crank. I take him home. He barely manages the stairs. The hospice nurse asks us where we've been. Daniel grins, gives me a hug, a handshake. The next night, he dies. Thank you. <laughs>